as you progressed forward, you came to this room where there was this big window out and you realize you're like elevated above the ground and it's moving. So you kind of realize you're in this vehicle of some sort. And then this like mechatronic robotic head looks into it. Like it's peering down and looking through inside. Hello and welcome to Making a Monster, where game designers show us their favorite monster and we discover how it works, why it works, and what it means. I'm Lucas Zellers. This week, we're leaving the Forgotten Realms for Eberron. Steve Fiddler creates adventures and encounters for D&D under the label Vorpal Dice Press. His monster blurs the line between enemy and environment, between dungeon and and dragon. My favorite, I just finished it, is the Warforged Colossus. So it's a Warforge that is the size of a skyscraper, 100 feet tall, has an entire dungeon inside of its body. Warforged are part of Keith Baker's Eberron setting for D&D, which is a bit like Tolkienian fantasy aged forward into an industrial revolution. It's a world where people travel by magical elevators, airships, and the lightning rail. It's also a world that only recently ended the longest and most destructive war anyone has ever seen. The Warforged are an entire species of sentient constructs designed to be soldiers, and now the war they fought in is over. Most Warforged are the size of a person, but a very few were built on a much, much grander scale. There's only like eight to ten of them that anyone knows about. They're not operational, so they were more like sites to scavenge, but they were given stats. They can stomp stuff and shoot laser beams and do some pretty cool stuff. The the specific Warforged Colossus that we're using, its name is Arcus, And that was very briefly detailed in Rising of the Last War as being a Warforged Colossus that was missing an arm and found in the glowing chasm in the Mornland. So there will definitely be a missing arm, but maybe we'll replace it with something. Maybe it'll have a chainsaw instead. I don't know. So what I wanted to do with it was this really cool idea that came from uh, a really, really weird dream that I had where essentially in the dream, you were fighting this endless horde of robots that were like cobbled together and you were in this like factory setting and it was kind of like fighting a zombie horde. So I had this whole idea and Mythic Encounters gave me a great opportunity to expand on that. A Mythic Encounter is an optional rule for creatures in D&D that triggers a Mythic trait, usually when the creature is reduced to zero hit points, after which it transforms, musters its strength, or exposes a new objective, extending the fight and unlocking new powers and abilities for the creature. My favorite thing about Mythic Encounters and that mechanic is you can take what is normal or you know, traditional and kind of builds a lot of uniqueness into it. Most high tier monsters in D&D have regional effects impacting the terrain around them, layer actions occurring at intervals during the fight and special legendary actions they can take after a player's turn. So I've given him some regional effects because he's placed in the Mornland, which is this devastated apocalyptic terrain that was left over from a devastating attack that happened in Eberron just before the campaign setting becomes playable. And and then you fight this monster, and its legendary actions are all about it creating more Warforged. So it creates a Warforged Titan, which is another large Warforged, and uses its actions to command it to move around and attack. So you're almost fighting two monsters at once. When you destroy it, the Colossus, it collapses in a heap, but then all this activity happens inside of its body. Like you can see the lights come on and all this activity in motion and an opening appears and it kind of invites you to come inside. And the whole second phase still uses the Warforged Colossus's stat block and its attacks and its legendary actions, but now it introduces its layer actions, which all occur inside of its body so it you know detaches portions of its body to make it more difficult for you to traverse and it squeezes you in the hallways and it spawns more warforged inside to defend itself and the idea being is you need to fight through 
this onslaught and get to its heart and you essentially have to destroy it to truly destroy the Colossus, to stop it from functioning and, and terrorizing anyone exploring the Mornland. So what you've kind of envisioned is kind of elevating what a monster can be and turning it into this whole like self-contained adventure within its own thing. I, I really like it because it gives you an opportunity to include a creature ca- a fight, an exploration pillar where you're diving into it and trying to figure out what what's ticking, and then also that dungeon crawl that you get in a typical D&D session where you're just kind of fighting through a dungeon and dealing with traps and that kind of thing. And it's all, almost all of it is enclosed in the stat block of the creature. And there's going to be some room descriptions like you would have with a typical adventure. And, you know, this is what's in this room. And, you know, here's what you can find here. And there'll be a map as well. But the idea is essentially to enclose as much as I can in a stat block, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. So what is it that you think makes this whole idea effective on its own? I think that by making it more than just a fight, you're not just punching a hit point punching bag. You're, you know, progressing the encounter further. You're uncovering mysteries. Why is there a creation forge inside this Colossus? Who would have put that there? Why is it not making real Warforged? Why is it only making these like abomination Warforged? You can kind of throw that at somebody and you, you've essentially got your next arc of the campaign, you know? And, and I think that that is where this encounter will be really effective. Steve wants his players to dread this creature, to feel a sense of ominous, inescapable doom. I think it'll be really useful as a tool. You can kind of put it in the distance. It can always be this thing that the players that are interacting with, like, NPCs and what have you, they kind of mention it and it'll always be this kind of carrot on a stick. And then when you finally do encounter it and hopefully defeat it, you've now got a whole other carrot on a stick to build off of. So it's kind of this midway point for your players narratively and it can kind of always just be sitting on the horizon for when all the other storylines sort of thread together. What do you think this tells us about what we what we want our monsters and villains to be. The story around it, why it exists, why you're fighting it is not necessarily black and white, but it's not ambiguous. It's, it's quite clearly a threat. You could maybe try to wrangle it and turn it to your side or try to find some alternative way of bypassing the encounter or accomplishing it in a different way. But I think some players like to have a very clear, unambiguous something to accomplish. I like the idea of using robots for that because you don't have to worry about their morals and their, you know, they're not usually persuadable. It's usually just some obstacle that you have to deal with. Given the deformed Warforged it spawns and its origin story in The Glowing Chasm, it's pretty easy to read the Warforged Colossus as a metaphor for nuclear fallout, a kind of steampunk Godzilla. As such, it affords players a straightforward moral choice. Whereas in Mythic Encounters, there's a lot of demon princes, Gratz and Orcus and what have you from Forgotten Realms lore, where they could have so many motives and your players can deal with them in so many different ways. You know, you could appeal to Gratz's vanity and possibly even get him to come to your side on things, at least momentarily. Whereas this is very clear cut. There's a lot of things to learn, but going into it, you know that this is something you're going to have to defeat or overcome right off the bat. And there's a very clear way to do that, which I think it tells, maybe doesn't tell the story, but I think that if you were to introduce this to your players, they would have a lot of fun with it. And I think a lot of players do just enjoy beating the bad guy sometimes. My guest is Steve Fiddler of Vorpal Dice Press. Arcus, the Warforged Colossus, will appear in Mythic Eberron, a new supplement featuring mythic encounters from monsters in the Eberron campaign setting, releasing on the Dungeon Masters Guild in September 2020. 
You can see a full page illustration of Arcus on the show's website, scintilla.studio slash monster. It's half character art, half map, all beautiful, and it was drawn by Saga McKenzie. As a special bonus for listeners of the podcast, Steve has made available one of Mythic Eberron's Mythic Rewards. It's called a salvaged Titan chassis, and it's a fully operational mech suit your D&D character can pilot. If you want the Saturday morning joie de vivre of Voltron, Power Rangers, or Gundam Wing in your Dungeons & Dragons campaign, download the free PDF at scintilla.studio slash monster. Here's how to get in touch with Steve. You can follow me on Twitter. It's at Vorpal Dice Press. I also have a website up and coming, which is VorpalDicePress.com. I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Thanks for listening to Making a Monster. If you like what you've heard and you want to support the show, please share it with the people in your gaming group. The show is available on 13 podcast platforms and counting, so there's an app for everyone. Your recommendation will go a long way to helping people take a chance on this show and it's a real gift to me and the creators I feature. Next time on Making a Monster. (laughs) All right. Symptoms of the disease include itching, sneezing, biting, spontaneous narcolepsy, willful disregard for one's own safety, a craving for fish, an overwhelming desire to shout one-liners, vertigo, and frequent public urination. Incubation time seems to be about 14 seconds, and the contagion is spread through bodily fluids, dirty toilet seats, crisp high fives, awkward hugs, and prolonged eye contact. In a possibly unrelated event, that nice colony of leper nuns we picked up hitchhiking on the side of the hyper route after their shuttle bus broke down has gone missing.